I'm going to talk about diastereomers in this lecture, but really what I'm after is what happens if you have more than one stereogenic center in a molecule. After all, we've talked briefly before about how people in general are achiral, that is that we have a plane of symmetry, but I actually have at least four stereogenic centers. My right hand, my left hand, my right foot, and my left foot are definitely stereogenic centers, but what makes me achiral overall is the fact that I have a plane of symmetry running right down the middle. So there are plenty of molecules out there that have many stereogenic centers, and we're gonna need to talk about those. But along the way, we are going to be trying to categorize what happens when you make some changes to a molecule. What is the relationship between pairs of molecules? So if you have pairs of molecules where all stereogenic centers are the same, then what you're really talking about is identical mo molecules. Actually, it's relatively easy to tell when you're looking at uh, pairs of identical molecules because they are superimposable. You can put them on top of each other. If you have mirror images, they are still superimposable mirror images. Likewise, it tends to be fairly easy to recognize when you have enantiomers present because then you have mirror images that cannot be superimposed. But there's another way of thinking about it, and that is that all of the chiral centers in the molecule, all of the stereogenic centers, have been flipped, have been reversed. So what is a diastereomer? Well, at its core, a diastereomer is a molecule, a pair of molecules, wherein at least one stereogenic center has remained the same, but at least one stereogenic center has been flipped. Again, in order for you to have diastereomers, stereomers, you must have at least two stereogenic centers. At least one has to remain the same. At least one has to be flipped, has to change. To help compare uh, pairs of molecules that might be diastereomers or enantiomers or identical, I wanted to use something known as Fisher projections. And this is kind of an old-timey way of drawing biomolecules like sugars and amino acids. It's a little bit outdated. It's a little weird way of representing stuff. But I actually like it a fair bit because you have to figure out how to rotate molecules well in your head or by drawing them out several times if you're trying to interpret these structures in a way that's more like what we're used to using. So these aren't exactly line angle structures, but you can convert them into line angle structures through a couple of steps. So I'm going to work with Fisher projections largely because it will force you to learn how to manipulate line angle structures and rotate things very well. So what is a Fisher projection? It's this strange looking representation of the molecule where you have a vertical line and horizontal lines. And basically what you need to know is that every single vertical line in a Fisher projection is pointed back away from you, whereas every every horizontal line in a Fisher projection is coming toward you. So in other words, this OH is coming toward us, this OH is coming toward us, these hydrogens are coming toward us, and then everything else is pointed back away. Which is why I was holding this model kit this way. So these are coming toward you, these are going back away. But the way we traditionally represent the molecule would be to unfold it and make the carbon chain be zigzag in the background. So we want the carbon chain of the molecule, the framework, the carbon skeleton, to be zigzagged, and then you have the OHs extending off of that. So what we need to do in order to translate a Fisher projection, which again looks like this, into the line angle format is first redraw it and then rotate it and figure out what it looks like. So first what we've done is take this two-dimensional representation and then try to convert it into a three-dimensional representation where the horizontal lines are coming toward us and the vertical lines are going back away. But then in order to figure out how to unfold it, what I usually do is I will rotate it in this direction and then also in this direction. So in this axis and then around that axis. And what I end up doing then is having this representation where the double bond is here, methyl down, and then the OHs both end up pointed back away. They were to the right, now they're back into the board. And then all we need to do is rotate so that the backbone ends up in the standard staggered conformation. And what that will give then is this OH unchanged and this OH coming toward us. So let me draw that. So backing up to the very beginning, Fisher projection converted into a three-dimensional image. We have the structure that looks like that. We then rotate in a couple of different directions, and we have a structure that looks like that. But this is in a bad eclipsed conformation, which is something that you'll learn about very soon. And we would like to draw it instead in the more normal staggered conformation, which means rotating around this bond so that the carbons end up in this sort of zigzag conformation that we're more familiar with than the OH 
is back and this OH is forward. And again, I'd like to reiterate, the reason why I want you to work on this skill is because it forces you to redraw things and learn how to rotate and interpret structures. Other than that, I'm now going to focus on using Fisher projections because it really does highlight for you easily what the stereogenic centers are. So now we're going to compare pairs of molecules. So the molecule here I'm holding in my left hand is the actual molecule drawn. The molecule I'm holding in, in my right hand likewise corresponds to the Fisher projection that I've drawn there. And I hope you can see at a glance that these two molecules are enantiomers because what we have here is multiple stereogenic centers, two in each molecule in fact. Those two are clearly mirror images of each other and then it shouldn't be possible for me to superimpose these molecules on each other. Specifically if I align the double bonds and the methyl groups what you see is that one molecule has the OHs on one side and the other molecule has the OHs on the other side. Said another way, you cannot superimpose them. Those aren't the same. So if they are mirror images of each other and they're not superimposable, then we know, of course, that these are enantiomers. So what we have here is a pair of enantiomers and that is exactly that is exactly what you'd expect from the flowcharts that I had drawn previously where what we have done is flip every single stereogenic center. We have stereogenic center that flipped, here's a stereogenic center that flipped. Obviously if I were to redraw this molecule again over here and make it look exactly the same it would be identical. Identical is relatively boring. However, how do you end up with a diastereomer? You have one of the stereogenic centers remain the same. The OH is on the right and both cases and you have one stereogenic center that flips. So again what we have is one stereogenic center has remained the same, the other stereogenic center has flipped, therefore these molecules are diastereomers. One stereogenic center the same, one is flipped. So I hope you can see at a glance then as well that if you compare these two molecules to each other, that in fact they also are diastereomers of each other. And that is because, of course, we have one stereogenic center that remains the same and one that changes. It's just which stereogenic center has remained the same is different. So of course, now these two stereogenic centers up at the top are going to be different, whereas it is the stereogenic centers at the bottom that are the same. So again, these are diastereomers of each other. So in order for you to have diastereomers, Again, he must have at least two stereogenic centers. At least one must remain the same. At least one must flip. Simple as that. If you have a molecule that contains chiral centers, you might be tempted to assume that the molecule is therefore chiral. But again, I'll remind you that we are proof positive that that's not true. Every one of us has a plane of symmetry, even though we have the stereogenic centers, our hands and our feet. So we are achiral overall. Therefore, it's possible to have molecules with planes of symmetry. For example, this one has a plane of symmetry right there, especially if I rotate this double bond facing that way, and therefore this molecule as a whole is a chiral. The name we give for molecules like this is meso. These compounds are meso. In order to contemplate whether a molecule is meso or not, there must be two things that are true. It must have multiple stereogenic centers, at least two. It could have more, but it must have at least two. And then secondly, it must also have a plane of symmetry. Any time that you have a meso compound, it is a chiral because the definition of an chiral compound is that it contains a plane of symmetry. Again, the Fisher projection for this molecule looks essentially like this, but then I can find my way to rotate to show you that it has a plane of symmetry, and there it is. There's a plane of symmetry in this molecule, therefore this molecule is achiral. And I wanted to show you one more example of a meso compound here. So again, here's the molecule depicted in the Fisher projection, and it may already be obvious to you where the plane of symmetry is, both in the Fisher projection and holding it up. But basically there's a plane of symmetry running right down there. This is meso. Now here's a question. How many chiral centers does the molecule have? Well the answer is only two. This is a chiral center. This is a chiral center. This is what we call a prochiral center in that it could easily become a chiral center but it is not chiral at the moment. So this position right here is prochiral. If we do anything to disrupt the symmetry in the molecule, it will become a stereogenic center. At the moment, however, it is not. Because if we were to assign priority of everything here, we have priority four, which is the hydrogen. We have priority one, which is the nitrogen. But then if you try to assign the priority for the remaining groups, what you have is a carbon and a carbon, so that's a tie, attached to a carbon and an oxygen and a hydrogen, so that's a tie. So this center is not chiral yet because there's 
a tie for priority two. Priority one is the nitrogen, priority two is each of those, priority four is the hydrogen. Again, anytime you have both stereogenic centers, multiple stereogenic centers, and a plane of symmetry, you have an achiral mo molecule, which is to say you have a meso compound. 